Good morning, and welcome to the Call of Pharmaceuticals fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the management's prepared remarks, a Q&A session will be held. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Naranjun Kamaswaran, Senior Vice President of Strategy for Kala Pharmaceuticals. Please proceed. Thank you, Operator, and thank you all for participating in today's call. Joining me from the company are Mark Iwicki, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, Todd Baysmore, Chief Operating Officer, Mary Remick, Chief Financial Officer, Kim Brazel, Chief Medical Officer, and Hong Ming Chen, Chief Scientific Officer. Today's call is being webcast live. The webcast link can be found in the Investors and Media section on our website, kalarx.com. During this call, we will be referring to non-GAAP financial measures, which are not prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The reconciliation of the non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures is available in our press release issued today, which can also be found on our website. On this call, we will make certain comments about Kala's future expectations, plans, and prospects that are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements will include observations associated with our commercialization of Inveltis, statements regarding the development and commercial plans for ISUVIS, including the Stride 3 clinical trial, the sufficiency of our cash resources, and projected revenue. These statements are based on the beliefs and expectations of management as of today, February 12th, 2020. Our actual results may differ materially from our expectations. The company undertakes no obligation to revise or update any statements to reflect events or circumstances after the date of this conference call. Investors should carefully read the risks and uncertainties described in today's press release, as well as the risk factors, which identify specific factors that may cause actual results or events to differ materially from those described in the forward-looking statement, included in the company's annual report on Form 10-K and other filings with the SEC. The Form 10-K will be filed with the SEC and will be available on our website. I now turn the call over to Kala CEO, Mark Iwicki. Thanks, Naranjan. Uh, Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Earlier today, we issued our financial results for the fourth quarter and full year ended December 31, 2019. 2019 was a defining year for Kala. We made significant progress on the Stride 3 Phase 3 trial of Isuvis, our dry eye disease pipeline candidate, and we successfully launched our first commercial product, Inveltis, the first and only twice-daily post-surgical ocular corticosteroid. We are pleased to announce that the last patient in the Stride 3 trial has now completed their final study visit. We remain on track to announce top-line data from Stride 3 in this quarter and to resubmit our NDA to the FDA in the second quarter of 2020. We expect our NDA resubmission will be designated as Class 2, which would be subject to a six-month review. If approved, we believe that Isuvis could become the preferred first-line prescription option for the treatment of dry eye flares. In January 2019, we successfully launched our first commercial product in Veltus for the treatment of post-operative inflammation and pain following ocular surgery. We've consistently received positive feedback from eye care professionals and have seen steady prescription growth throughout the year. Since launch, over 144,000 Inveltus prescriptions were written by more than 3,300 eye care professionals. Our commercial team has done a terrific job educating prescribers on Inveltus and we are pleased to provide ocular surgery patients with the only BID option that delivers strong efficacy without compromising on safety or tolerability. We look forward to seeing demand continue to increase as we enter our second year post-launch. Importantly, we believe our success with Inveltis provides a strong foundation as we prepare for the potential launch of Isuvis later this year. I will now pass the call over to Kim Brazel, our Chief Medical Officer, to further provide details on the Stride 3 clinical trial. Kim? Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everyone. As Mark noted, we're pleased to announce that all patients in the Stride 3 trial have now completed their final study visits and that all patient assessments have been completed. We're now preparing for database lock and statistical analysis. We continue to be on track 
for top line results in this quarter. As a reminder, we have previously completed one phase two and two phase three clinical trials, stride one and stride two. In these trials, we demonstrate statistical significance for the primary sign endpoint of conjunctival hyperemia in all three trials. In addition, statistical significance was achieved for two pre-specified primary symptom endpoints, ocular discomfort in the entire population and ocular discomfort in a predefined subgroup of patients with more severe baseline discomfort in stride one with a strong trend for both symptom endpoints in stride two. Asuvis was very well tolerated with a very low level of adverse events and intraocular pressure effects comparable to vehicle. Based on clinical data from these three trials, we filed a new drug application in October of 2018. In August of 2019, we announced that we had received a complete response letter from the FDA with respect to this NDA. In the CRL, the FDA indicated that efficacy data from an additional clinical trial would be needed to support a resubmission. We initiated the ongoing STRIDE 3 trial in the third quarter of 2018, which we expect will serve as the basis of our response to the CRL. We designed STRIDE 3 with certain modifications to the inclusion-exclusion criteria relative to STRIDE 1 and STRIDE 2, which we believe will improve the probability of success of the trial. As a reminder, STRIDE 3 has two independent primary symptom endpoints, ocular discomfort in the entire population and ocular discomfort in the more severe subgroup. We believe that achieving statistical significance for either of these pre-specified symptom endpoints in STRIDE 3 will be sufficient to demonstrate efficacy to support the resubmission of the NDA. We're looking forward to announcing top-line results for STRIDE 3 in this quarter. I will now pass the call over to Todd Bazemore, our Chief Operating Officer, to provide further details on Inveltus and Asubis. Todd? Thank you, Kim. We are very excited about the commercial potential of Isuvis. As a reminder, there are approximately 33 million patients with dry eye disease in the U.S., of which over 17 million have been diagnosed and are managed by an eye care professional. However, less than 1 million of them are currently treated with a prescription therapy. Quantitative market research studies conducted with dry eye patients indicate that approximately 80 to 90 percent of them report experiencing dry eye flares. We estimate that there are over 300 million dry eye flare days per year in the U.S. alone, representing a total addressable market potential in excess of approximately $8 billion annually. If approved, we believe Isuvis could become the preferred prescription therapy for the vast majority of dry eye patients who experience episodic flares and would benefit from a rapid-acting, short-term treatment they can address the inflammation which is considered a key trigger of flares. Our market research indicates that Isuvis would be used in mild to moderate patients who currently use palliative approaches such as artificial tears, which do not directly impact ocular inflammation, as well as in more severe patients as an adjunctive therapy to their chronic dry eye prescription medication as either induction therapy or to treat breakthrough symptoms. This will allow us to position Isuvis as first-line therapy to treat flares for all dry eye patients. Our market research also indicates eye care professionals intend to prescribe Isuvis for more than half of their dry eye patients, regardless of whether they are currently on a prescription medication or are only using artificial tears. Our team is making great progress on launch planning preparations, and we feel we are well positioned to leverage our existing commercial infrastructure to support the potential launch of Isuvis in late 2020. Additionally, we continue to make good progress with Inveltus. We expect continued growth of prescriptions and net revenue in 2020, driven by growing demand and improved gross-to-net discounts. In the fourth quarter, there were approximately 47,000 prescriptions of Inveltus reported by Symphony Health, which represents an increase of approximately 17% over the third quarter. This positive growth trend for Inveltus in the fourth quarter is particularly encouraging, considering that the branded steroid market, NRXs, were down by 16.5% between the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. Importantly, Inveltus demonstrated strong prescription and market share growth throughout 2019, 
a year in which the other major branded and generic steroids demonstrated declining trends. We've also seen continued growth in the number of prescribers. To date, over 3,300 eye care professionals have prescribed in Veltus. We have also achieved an 11.2% NRX share in the branded steroid market and an 18.8% NRX branded market share among our called on eye care professionals. We recently completed a large quantitative market research study with 200 eye care professionals. In this study, ECPs rated in Veltus highly for the key attribute of providing the best balance of efficacy and safety in the oculus steroid class. Approximately half of these ECPs reported having already prescribed in Veltus and that they intend to increase prescribing from a current self-reported market share of 6%, growing to 25% over the next six months. On the market access front, we have achieved unrestricted access for approximately 80% of all commercial lives and approximately 23% of Medicare Part D lives. The team has executed well on the launch of Inveltus, and we have designed our commercial infrastructure to be readily scalable to support the potential future launch of ISUVIS. If the FDA approves ISUVIS, we plan to increase the sales force from our current 57 sales professionals to a total of between 75 to 100 who will promote both ISUVIS and Inveltus. We expect a sales force of this size will allow us to effectively cover the eye care professionals that are responsible for approximately 75 to 85 percent of all dry eye prescriptions. So in summary, if approved, ISUVIS has the potential to become the preferred first-line prescription therapy for the treatment of dry eye flares. Launch preparations for ISUVIS are already well underway, and the Inveltus launch continues to progress well with strong growth in prescriptions and market share. I will now turn the call over to Mary to discuss our financial results. Thanks, Todd. During this discussion of our financial results, I will reference certain non-GAAP financial measures. These non-GAAP financial measures exclude stock compensation, depreciation, and non-cash interest expense. For a full reconciliation of our GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures, please refer to today's press release, which is available on our website. Our cash position as of December 31st, 2019, was $85.4 million, compared to $170.9 million as of December 31st, 2018. We anticipate that our existing cash, together with projected Inveltus revenue, will enable us to fund operations into the second quarter of 2021. For the fourth quarter of 2019, we reported Inveltus net revenue of $1.2 million, and for the full year 2019, we reported Inveltus net revenue of $6.1 million. As a reminder, we recognize revenue when products are delivered to distributors. Net revenues in Q4 were impacted by higher reserve estimates at the end of 2019. We, accept, we expect improvements in our gross to net discounts beginning in Q1 2020 and to continue throughout the year and going forward. Cost of product revenues for the fourth quarter of 2019 were $700,000. We began capitalizing inventory costs for Inveltus after receipt of FDA approval on August 22, 2018. Prior to receiving FDA approval, such costs were expensed as research and development. Non-GAAP cost of product revenues was $600,000 for the fourth quarter of 2019. FG&A expenses for the fourth quarter of 2019 were $14.5 million compared to $14.3 million for the same period in 2018. The increase in SG&A expenses for the fourth quarter of 2019 compared to the same period in 2018 was primarily due to costs associated with the commercial infrastructure being in place for the entire fourth quarter of 2019 as compared to only a portion of the fourth quarter of 2018, as well as an increase in facility-related costs partially offset by lower pre-launch external costs incurred during the fourth quarter of 2018. Non-GAAP SG&A expenses for the fourth quarter of 2019 were $12.7 million, which is consistent with the same period in 2018. R&D expenses for the fourth quarter of 2019 were $6.1 million, compared to $9.2 million for the same period in 2018. The decrease in R&D expenses for the fourth quarter of 2019, compared to the same period in 2018, was primarily due to Inveltus-related manufacturing and headcount costs, which in 2018 were classified as R&D expenses prior to FDA approval, and the NDA fee, filing fee for Inveltus of $2.6 million incurred in the fourth quarter of 2018. 
Non-GAAP R&D expenses for the fourth quarter were $5.5 million compared to $8.6 million for the same period in 2018. Loss from operations for the fourth quarter of 2019 was $20.2 million compared to $23.6 million for the same period in 2018. Non-GAAP operating loss was $17.6 million for the fourth quarter of 2019 compared to $21.3 million for the same period in 2018. Net loss for the fourth quarter of 2019 was $22 million or 63 cents per share compared to a net loss of $25.2 million or 76 cents per share for the same period in 18. Non-GAAP net loss was $19.2 million for the fourth quarter of 2019 compared to $22.7 million for the same quarter of 2018. Please refer to today's press release for the weighted average number of shares used in the calculation of our net loss per share for the quarterly and annual periods discussed. That concludes our prepared remarks for today. I'll now turn the call over to the operator for questions. Thank you, and as a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Once again, that is star 1 to ask a question. Our first question comes from Liana Musatos with Wedbush Security. Your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. Um, can you remind us of the difference in patient characteristics in Stride 2 versus Stride 1 associated with the symptom endpoint, and what changes were made to the inclusion-exclusion criteria in Stride 3? Uh, thanks, Liana. Uh, a nice question. We haven't really... Uh, talked about the difference in the patient characteristics, but we can talk a bit about the changes we made uh, in the stride three inclusion exclusion criteria. And the primary focus of those changes was to screen out patients that did not have a stable symptom profile during run-in. They could be either patients that were improving significantly during the run-in but still would have made randomization or patients that had highly variable uh, symptom profile through the run-in. Uh, we, we often give an example, there were 80 or so patients in the STRIDE 2 trial that had significant improvement in symptoms during the run-in phase, but had still had sufficient symptoms to be eligible for randomization. As we look at those patients, we assume these were patients that were having a typical dry flare, and they continued to improve regardless of whether they were on drug or placebo. In that situation, if you remove those 90 patients from the analysis, then you get a p-value of 0.02. That's just one example. We had a couple of other changes. If you take those uh, patients that we've excluded in stride 3 and remove those from the analysis of stride 1 and stride 2, then you get p-values of 0 0.002 for both of the trials. So. Uh, our goal was sort of um, to eliminate those pr uh, patients that were problematic patients in stride two. Thank you. Thank you. And our following question comes from the line of Chris Schott with J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Morning. This is Chris Nero with Chris Schott. So first is on Inveltis. We have uh, seen solid progress on coverage and script growth uh, throughout 2019. And you previously discussed targeting roughly 6,000 to 7,000 high prescribing physicians. Uh, could you update us on where we stand on adding new physicians for this group? And then second on Isuvis. Uh, the completion, with the completion of the Stride 3 study, can you just reiterate the factors that give you confidence in the six-month filing timeline? Thank you very much. Sure, Chris. Uh, thanks for the questions. This is Todd. I'll handle the Inveltus question, and then I'll hand it over to Kim to address uh, your question with uh, regards to iService. So we still, our target universe for Inveltus is about six to 7,000 physicians. Um, you know, those physicians collectively represent uh, 80 to 85 percent of uh, prescribing of all ocular steroids. And of that universe, uh, to date, uh, over 3,300 have already prescribed uh, Inveltus. We're at about 50% um, penetration of the target universe in terms of uh, prescribers of Inveltus, uh, and that number is up significantly quarter over quarter, 22% uh, growth in number of prescribers, uh, growth in number of prescribers um, um, from Q3 to Q4. I'll hand it over to Kim to answer your ISUBIS call. Uh, with regards to the resubmission, as you recall, Chris, we did submit an NDA 
and received a complete response letter. In that situation, then the resubmission is considered a Class II resubmission, and that timeline for that Class II or the producer for that is six months. It's a very similar situation that Shire experienced with Zydra, where they had a CRL, resubmitted the results, and got approval in, in that case, five months. So we're quite confident that the six-month timeline uh, is correct. Thanks so much. Thank you. And our following question comes from the line of Esther Rajavelu with Oppenheimer. Your line is open. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for taking my question. Uh, can you please help us understand how you're thinking about 2020 priorities in the context of, um, you know, a positive and um, or, or a negative readout, really, for, for ISUVIS? Sure. Hi, Esther. It's Mark. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're feeling, uh, you know, a lot of excitement. Uh, we're, we're nearing the end uh, of the STRIDE 3 trial, and uh, excited about uh, seeing the results uh, in the first quarter and being able to report those out to everyone. And, you know, that will be a huge change for the company. Um, we really uh, understand that the unmet need for a product uh, in the dry eye market that could be used in a first-line fashion, could be used as adjunctive therapy to Zydra and Restasis, uh, is just something that the market has wanted for a long time. Um, you know, there are no really quick-acting uh, products that can be used to treat patients' flares, and we know that over 90% of patients experience these flares routinely. And that's whether they're on uh, just uh, OTC therapies like artificial tears or, or other uh, kind of home remedies or if they're on uh, more maintenance products. So that's a real change for us. The good news is we've created a terrific infrastructure we have an outstanding sales force and commercial organization uh, with a really deep experience both in the post-surgery market as well as the dry eye market. So we are uh, gearing up and, and ready to hopefully see those positive results, um, you know, in, in a matter of uh, weeks here and to uh, be able to get the NDA in and then hopefully secure approval and, and launch. And I think as Todd mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're fully capable of launching the product with our existing sales force, uh, and then also adding some additional representatives to make sure that we appropriately um, can go after what we think is uh, just a, a huge unmet need in the marketplace and, and target all of the appropriate eye care professionals. Um, you know, certainly if uh, there's more work to be done, we'll have to evaluate that if the, the results uh, require us to, to take some time and, and we'll get back to everyone and, and let people know. But right now we're, we're gearing up and uh, excited what, for what we hope to be a, a real positive outcome on Stride 3 and uh, then preparing to make the file and the launch. Gotcha. And a quick follow-up from, from, a, from a cost basis. Um, are we sort of assuming that um, you know, over the course of 2020, you're not. You're, it sounds like you're not going to need to spend a ton more than what you've been doing with on the sales force. I just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, no, that's right. I think in general, uh, 2020 is much more of a, a sort of stable year. And uh, if we uh, did secure the approval later this year, then uh, you know we will most likely and plan to increase the the sales force, but our expectation would be right now that, you know, that would likely come either very late in the year or early next year, depending on when we secure the approval. So you're right, this year is uh, much more of a stable uh, OPEX situation. Of course, as the trial ends, um, you know, though that expense run rate, uh, you know, will be uh, reduced a bit. So um, you're, you're spot on with your assessment. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Byron Amin with Jeffries. Your line is open. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my questions. Mark, can you, are you, you got on the call a little late, but can you just go over um, what type of a sales force increase you would need um, if Stride 3 were positive and you, if you were able to secure a uh, dry eye <coughs> approval? Absolutely. Uh, I'll just have Todd answer that for you, Brian. 
Sure, Baron. You, you know, the current uh, sales organization is about uh, 57 sales representatives. We believe we would grow the sales force to somewhere between 75 and 100 sales representatives. And in that range, uh, it would allow us to effectively cover 75 to 85 percent of all the dry eye prescriptions being written today. Okay, and then I guess just from a pipeline standpoint, you know, can you maybe update us on where the um, TKI program is for retinal diseases? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we have advanced that over the 2019 calendar year, and, um, you know, we've not made any specific announcements about that program, but it um, it does continue to move forward. And, of course, you know, over the last few years, we've, concentrated the vast majority of our resources on our first two programs. Um, but uh, hopefully on the other side of positive dry eye data and uh, securing an approval, that is an important program to us, and we would expect to invest uh, more in it over time. And, you know, it's just a reminder that is an NCE kinase inhibitor that our internal discovery team has uh, developed, and uh, we're, we're quite excited about it, but again, have remained focused on in Veltus and hopefully the upcoming positive data for Isuvis. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, that is star one to ask a question. And our next question comes from Yi Chen with H.C. Wainwright. Your line is open. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my first question is, it seems that the growth rate in, in Veltis scripts has been uh, slower, <coughs> slower in, uh, during the past two quarters. Could you uh, let us know what would be the catalyst in 2020 and beyond that to that will continue to drive the growth in, in Veltis scripts? Sure, yeah, this is Todd. Um, you know, I think the, the growth trends have been really strong for Inveltis. Remember, they were scripts were up um, in Q3 by 30% versus Q2. Uh, the growth rate was 17% for Q4 versus Q3, but that was largely impacted by the holidays, right? With Between Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, um, you, know, you have a lot of uh, practices that are not conducting surgery, cataract surgery during that period of time. If we were to back out those holidays and treat them as normal days um, with normal script volumes, our growth again in the fourth quarter would have been up 30% quarter over quarter, um, uh, just like it was Q3 over Q2. So we think the growth rates have been tremendous uh, and expect continued growth rates this year, largely driven by our increasing market access. So you'll recall that in the second quarter, third quarter of last year, uh, our commercial market access was around 50%. In fourth quarter, that jumped up to 80%. Uh, so we currently have, between our Medicare Part D and commercial access, unrestricted access to about 145 million lives in the U.S. in field that um, we've got a lot of uh, headroom in front of us to continue to show strong growth in the brand uh, throughout 2020. Thank you. Uh, my second question is, could you uh, give us some color on the gross margin in the fourth quarter of 2019 and whether we can expect that Isuvis to have a similar gross margin compared to Inveltis? Um, I'm assuming you're referring to the, the reserves that we took um, at the end of the year. So uh, they were higher in Q4 of 19, and there are a few items that contributed to that in the fourth quarter. Yes, yes. First, okay. it was the resetting of the deductibles under the health insurance plans um, as, of, as of January 1st, which meant that more uh, patients were using our copay card uh, when they're in the higher deductible portion of their plan. And second, um, we had a price increase on January 1, which meant that uh, the units that we sell to distributors in 2019 uh, we would reserve for at uh, the rebates based on the new 2020 price. So those both both impacted uh, the reserve that we took in, in 2019. Okay. Uh, for Isuvis, will it have a higher gross margin than in Veltus? So we haven't, um, we haven't talked about that yet and given mm -hmm. guidance on Isuvis yet. Okay, got it. Uh, my final question is, uh, can we assume that the R and D expense, quarterly R and D expenses, will be lower significantly once the Strike Three trial is completed? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, at this time, we don't have another large phase two or phase three program um, that we're putting into place. We have earlier stage programs. So, you know, it is our expectation that compared to 2018 and 2019, that um, overall the R&D expense in particular associated with clinical uh, work will be uh, reduced. Um, there's always some R&D expense uh, when you're manufacturing uh, new supplies and other things, um, but as it relates to clinical uh, trial work, uh, we do expect a reduction there. Got it. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Uh, could you give us the uh, shares outstanding at the end of 2019 and when the tanking will be filed? Sure. Uh, 35.5 million shares outstanding at the end of 19, and we'll file the 10K this week. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not showing. I'm showing no more questions in the queue. I'll turn the call back to Mr. Awicki. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your time this morning. We uh, greatly appreciate. Uh, your interest at this uh, really exciting juncture for Kala Pharmaceuticals, and we look forward to updating you later in the quarter. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time.